Uh, this is Lecture 57F in the ABCs of Communism Bolshevism 2018 series. Um, and our subject is the Democratic Republic of Vietnam and its war uh, against the U.S. and Indochina from 1954 to 1975. Now, in 1954, President Dwight D. Eisenhower turned his attention for the first time from Korea to Vietnam and expressed his opinion that I have never talked or corresponded with a person knowledgeable in Indo-Chinese affairs who did not agree that had elections been held as of the time of the fighting, possibly 80% of the population would have voted for the communist Ho Chi Minh. Now, U.S. Secretary of State John Foster Dulles said the U.S. chose Ngo Dinh Diem, a fanatical Roman Catholic, to be president of their puppet state of the Republic of Vietnam because he was fervently anti-communist and, quote, anyway, we did not have anyone else, unquote. So the gringos imposed a foreign religion, religionist on the majority of the Vietnamese people who were Buddhist and instantly alarmed by Diem's dedication of the country to the Virgin Mary. And that's how they kicked it off. Now, from April to June 1955, Diem eliminated any political opposition by launching military operations against two religious groups, the Cao De and the Hoa Hao. He created, in effect, the broad-based opposition to his fascist tactics that he blamed on the communists. In the summer of 1955, Diem then launched the Denounce the Communists campaign, during which communists and other anti-government elements were arrested, imprisoned, tortured, and executed. On 23 October 1955, a referendum on the future for South Vietnam was rigged by Diem's brother Ngo Dinh Nu, so Diem was credited with 98.2% of the vote, including 133% in Saigon. His U.S. advisors later apologizing for their role said they had recommended a more modest winning margin of 60 to 70 percent. Three days later, the willful puppet declared South Vietnam to be the Republic of Vietnam, ROV, with himself as president. In March 1956, Le Duan, who was the Communist Party's expert on South Vietnam, came to Hanoi and he presented a plan to revive the insurgency entitled, quote, The Road to the South, unquote, to the other members of the Politburo in Hanoi. The DRV leadership, that is the Democratic Republic of Vietnam leadership, approved the initial measures to revive the Southern insurgency in December of 86. Now, in August of 56, Diem instituted a death penalty against any activity deemed communist. 12,000 suspected opponents of Diem were killed between 55 and 57. By the end of 1958, an estimated 40,000 political prisoners had been jailed. In May of 1957, Diem undertook a 10-day visit to the United States. President Eisenhower pledged his continued support, and a parade was held in Diem's honor in New York City. Former Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara wrote in his 1999 book, Argument Without End, that the new American patrons of the Republic of Vietnam were almost completely ignorant of Vietnamese culture. They knew little of the language or long history of the country. These were what some of the others called the best and the brightest. In 1958, communist forces for the war were organized under a single command structure. In January of 1959, the Communist Party of Vietnam approved a people's war in the South. In May 1959, what was called Group 559 was established to maintain and upgrade the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Now, at this time, in 1959, the route was a six-month mountain trek through Laos. The DRV sent 30,000 construction workers to rebuild the supply route to the National Liberation Front in South Vietnam. And leaving the north of Vietnam, it took the route of least resistance in Indochina through Laos and Cambodia, and then re-entered the south of Vietnam. By August of 1959, it was far enough along for the first arms delivery to be made to the National Liberation Front, from here on I'll just call it NLF or Viet Cong, uh, 
by January 1961, the, oh, the construction of the Ho Chi Minh Trail was complete, at least in its first phase. Now, meanwhile, in December 1960, the National Liberation Front, NLF, or Viet Cong, was announced. Its stated intent was the uniting of all anti-DM activists, including non-communists. According to the Pentagon Papers, the NLF placed heavy emphasis on the withdrawal of American advisors and influence on land reform and liberalization of the DM regime on coalition government and the neutralization of Vietnam. Always the leaders of the NLF were kept secret for obvious reasons. The reasons for the popularity of the NLF were the class relations in the countryside. The vast majority of the population lived in villages in the countryside where the essential issue was land reform. The Viet Minh had reduced rents and debts and had leased, leased communal lands mostly to the poorer peasants. Diem brought the landlords back to the villages. People who were farming land they held for years now had to return it to landlords and pay years of back rent. The South Vietnamese army enforced this rent collection. Now, these new divisions within villages reproduced those that had existed against the French. Quote, 75% support for the NLF, 20% trying to stay neutral, and 5% firmly pro-government, unquote. Now, from 1961 to 1963, 40,000 regular Army DRV soldiers were sent to the NLF. In 1964, the DRV sent another 10,000 regular Army troops to help the NLF, and in 1965, the DRV sent another 100,000 regulars. Kennedy's escalation from 1961 to 1963. In the 1960 U.S. presidential election, Senator John F. Kennedy from Massachusetts defeated incumbent Vice President Richard Nixon. Eisenhower warned Kennedy about Laos and Vietnam, but he thought Europe and Latin America at that time were more important than Asia. In his inaugural address, Kennedy made the ambitious pledge to pay any price bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe in order to assure, assure the survival and success of liberty. In June of 1961, he bitterly disagreed with Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev when they met in Vienna to discuss key U.S.-Soviet issues. Only 16 months later, the U.S.-Soviet issues included the Cuban Missile Crisis of 16 to 28 October 1962, that played out on television worldwide. It was the closest the Cold War had come to escalating into a full nuclear war. The Kennedy administration was committed to the Cold War Truman Doctrine foreign policy carried on by the Eisenhower administrations. In 1961, the U.S. had 50,000 troops in Korea. JFK inherited the negotiated settlement between the pro-Western government of Laos and Pathet Lao communist movement but was determined to draw a line in the sand and prevent a communist victory in Vietnam, and he told James Reston of the New York Times immediately after his Vienna meeting with Khrushchev, quote, now we have a problem making our power credible and Vietnam looks like the place, unquote. In May of 1961, U.S. VP Lyndon B. Johnson visited Saigon and enthusiastically declared to him the Winston Churchill of Asia. Asked why he had made the comment, Johnson replied, Dem's the only boy we got out there. And in that he was just following John Foster Dulles. Johnson assured Diem of more and aid in molding a fighting force that could resist the communists. However, Diem would have been well advised had he been told that LBJ had made a career out of wheeling and double dealing. Kennedy's policy toward South Vietnam rested on the assumption that Diem and his forces had to defeat the guerrillas on their own. He said he was against the deployment of American combat troops, that, quote, to introduce U.S. forces in large numbers there today, while it might have an initially favorable military impact, would almost certainly lead to adverse political and, in the long run, adverse military consequences. Diem's policy, on the other hand, was ambiguous. The quality of his military was piss-poor. Corrupt leadership and political promotions were diagnostic. 
the frequency of guerrilla attacks rose as the insurgency gathered steam. Kennedy wanted to use special forces for counterinsurgency warfare in third world countries. He believed that the guerrilla tactics employed by the Green Beret special forces would be effective in the brushfire war in Vietnam. On the other hand, JFK advisors Maxwell Taylor and Walt Rostow recommended that U.S. regular army troops be sent to South Vietnam disguised as flood relief workers. Kennedy rejected the idea but increased military assistance yet again. In April of 1962, John Kenneth Galbraith warned Kennedy of the, quote, danger we shall replace the French as colonial force in the area and bleed as the French did, unquote. By November 63, there were 16,000 American military personnel in South Vietnam, up from Eisenhower's 900 advisors. Then in late November 63, JFK was assassinated. Strategic Hamlets The Strategic Hamlet program initiated in late 1961 was a joint CIA puppet army program to resettle the rural population into fortified de facto concentration camps. Implemented in early 1962, it was a program of forced relocation, village internment, and segregation of the rural South Vietnamese. Foolishly, the gringo CIA brains thought the peasantry would be isolated from communist insurgents. By November 1963, the program had failed, and it officially ended in 1964. Meanwhile, paramilitary officers from the CIA's Special Activities Division trained and led Hmong tribesmen in Laos and took them into Vietnam. Then Hmong numbered in the tens of thousands, and they conducted direct action missions led by CIA paramilitary officers. They were used against the communist Pathet Lao forces and their North Vietnamese supporters, while the indigenous population of southern Vietnam was locked up in hamlets. The CIA also ran the Phoenix program of assassinating village chiefs. It sat in on the Military Assistance Command Vietnam, Studies and Observation Group, which in short was MACV, SOG. It was originally named the Special Operations Group, but that name was changed for cover, cover purposes. Now we come to the assassination of Edgo Dien Diem. The inept performance of Diem's army typically failed in action as in the Battle of Ap Bac on 2 January 1963. There a small NLF unit won a battle against a much larger and better equipped Diem force whose officers refused to engage in combat. The Diem forces were led in that battle by Diem's most trusted general, Hun Ban Cao, commander of the 4th Corps. Cao was a Catholic who had been corruptly promoted with his main job being to stave off coups. He had once vomited with fear during a communist attack, and in Washington the CIA concluded that Diem was incapable of defeating the communists. He seemed concerned only with fending off coups. After coup attempts in 1960 and 1962, which he attributed to CIA encouragement, they described him as a paranoiac. Robert F. Kennedy noted, quote, Diem wouldn't make even the slightest concessions. He was difficult to reason with." Unquote. Strategic handlings had failed. The South Vietnamese regime was incapable of winning the peasantry because of its class base among landlords, and indeed there was no longer a regime in the sense of a relatively stable political alliance and functioning bureaucracy. Instead, civil government and military operations had virtually ceased the National Liberation Front had made great progress and was close to declaring provisional revolutionary governments in large areas. Now, discontent with Diem's policies exploded following the Hugh Fat Dan shooting of nine Buddhists who were protesting against the ban on the Buddhist flag on Visak, the Buddha's birthday. This resulted in mass protests against discriminatory policies that gave privileges to the Catholic Church and its adherents. Diem's elder brother, Ngo Dien Thuc, was the Archbishop of Hue and therefore adamantly opposed to the separation of church and state. The government had bankrolled Thuc's anniversary celebrations shortly before Visak, and Vatican flags were displayed prominently. Knights of Columbus paramilitaries throughout Diem's rule 
demolished Buddhist pagodas. Diem refused to make concessions to the Buddhist majority or take responsibility for the deaths. On the 21st of August 1963, the Arvin, that is the Republican, the Vietnam Army, special forces of Colonel Le Quang Tung, loyal to Diem's younger brother of Ngo Dinh Nu, raided pagodas across Vietnam. This smash and trash action caused widespread destruction and left hundreds dead. Kennedy and McNamara. In June of 1963, gringo officials began discussing the possibility of a regime change for Vietnam. The U.S. Department of State was in favor of a coup. The Defense Department still favored Diem. Uh, the CIA floated an alternative trial balloon. They wanted to remove Diem's younger brother, Nu, who controlled the secret police and special forces and was the architect of the Ngo family rule. The CIA plan was sent to the U.S. Embassy in Saigon in 1963 in Cable 243. On the 2nd of November 1963, the Central Intelligence Agency told their puppet army generals to remove Diem. Thus Diem was overthrown and executed, along with his brother. Maxwell Taylor remembered that Kennedy, quote, rushed from the room with a look of shock and dismay on his face, unquote, when told of the Diem brothers' fate. He had not anticipated Diem's murder, nor for that matter, his own, only three weeks away. <laughs> Meanwhile, the U.S. Ambassador to South Vietnam, Henry Cabot Lodge, invited the coup leaders to the embassy and congratulated them. Ambassador Lodge informed Kennedy that, quote, the prospects now are for a shorter war, unquote. Kennedy wrote Lodge a letter congratulating him for a fine job. Following the coup, chaos ensued. Hanoi took advantage of the situation and increased its support for the guerrillas. Puppet Vietnam entered a period of extreme political instability as one military government toppled another in quick succession. The communists exposing each lackey regime as just that of the Americans. Now, U.S. military advisors were now embedded at every level of the South Vietnamese armed forces. The Pentagon knew it was the only way to make them fight. In the remaining few days of the Kennedy administration, it wanted it on the winning, winning over of the hearts and minds of the population. The Pentagon under JFK was hostile to any role for U.S. advisors other than conventional troop training. However, that was because they were forced to toe the line. In truth, they hated the Kennedy boys and always had. The top, top brass eagerly looked forward to Dallas. Johnson's Escalation, 1963-69. At the time Lyndon B. Johnson took over the presidency, he had only a meet-and-greet role in its JFK policy toward Vietnam. Of LBJ in Vietnam under JFK, presidential aide Jack Joseph Valente had a rec recollection. This longtime president of the Motion Picture Association of America, film and theatrical union boss, and a typical Kennedy Hollywood favorite, later said, quote, Vietnam at the time was no bigger than a man's fist on the horizon. We hardly discussed it because it was not worth discussing, unquote. Because, upon becoming president, however, Johnson immediately had to focus on Vietnam. On November 24, 1963, LBJ said, the battle against communism must be joined with strength and determination, quote, unquote. The pledge came at a time when the situation in South Vietnam was deteriorating, especially in places like the Mekong Delta, because of the recent coup against Diem. Johnson knew that he had inherited a rapidly deteriorating situation in South Vietnam and understood that the powers that be in Gringolandia had removed his predecessor. He had little choice but to give them the war they insisted on fighting or accept the fate of his old boss. Meanwhile, the Vietnamese Puppet Military Coup Council was made up of 12 members headed by General Durong Van Minh. One journalist on the, recall, on the ground recalled Van Minh as a model of lethargy. Gringo Ambassador Lodge cabled home about Minh. Will he be strong enough to get on top of things? Unquote. Apparently not, because the CIA overthrew his regime in January 64. 
their new favorite led the coup of General Nguyen Khan. However, he proved to be not to their satisfaction for long, and several more coups happened quickly. The Pentagon wins out. On August 2, 1964, the USS Maddox on an intelligence mission along the DRV coast allegedly fired upon and damaged several torpedo boats that had been stalking it in the Gulf of Tonkin. A second attack was reported two days later on the USS Turner Joy and Maddox in the same area. Lyndon Johnson commented to Under Secretary of State George Ball that, quote, those sailors out there may have been shooting at flying fish, unquote. Whatever else, whatever else he may have been, LBJ was not naive. He knew this was the way the Joint Chiefs engineered to get the war he had promised them. There was no attack, and the whole thing was staged. Shades of many similar things to come. On August 7, 1964, the U.S. Congress approved the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, and it was signed by Johnson, and it gave the President power to conduct military operations in Indochina without declaring war. The Tonkin Resolution allowed the President unilateral power to launch a full-scale war if the President deemed it necessary. In the same month, Johnson began his career in Orwellian doublespeak. He said that he was not, quote, committing American boys to fighting a war that I think ought to be fought by the boys of Asia to help protect their own land, unquote. But by 1964, the NLF armed units grew to about 100,000, and against them were a million conscripts in the puppet army and 16,500 U.S. troops. And in December of 64, the puppet army suffered heavy losses at the Battle of Ben Gia. Both sides saw the battle as decisive for the war. Previously, communist forces had relied on hit-and-run guerrilla uh, tactics. However, at Ben Gia, they had fielded a regular army and defeated the puppet army in a stand-up, toe-to-toe battle. In early 1965, it witnessed nearly all of the $8,000 billion CIA strategic hamlets destroyed by the National Liberation Front. The U.S. National Security Council was now desperate and recommended a three-stage escalation of the bombing of the DRV itself. On the 2nd of March, 65, Operation Flaming Dart, Operation Rolling Thunder, and Operation Arc Light commenced. The U.S. bombing campaign lasted three years. In June of 65, puppet forces were defeated at the Battle of Dog Joy. Between March 65 and November 68, Rolling Thunder deluged the North with a million tons of missiles, rockets, and bombs. Bombings was not restricted to North Vietnam. Other aerial campaigns targeted different parts of the NLF and DRV Army in the South, as well as Laos and Cambodia, and all failed. Vietnam would settle for nothing other than victory, and even so, the Chief of Staff of the U.S. Air Force, the well-known fascist warmonger Curtis LeMay, said, we're going to bam bomb them back into the Stone Age. Yet the Air Force could not protect its own Vietnamese air bases. It was decided that U.S. Air Force bases needed more protection than the South Vietnamese military million-man conscript army could provide. On 8 March 1965, 3,500 U.S. Marines had been dispatched to South Vietnam, and that Marine deployment was increased to nearly 200,000 by December of that year, 1965. Puppet desertion rates were increasing and morale non-existent. General William Westmoreland informed Admiral U.S. Grant Sharp, Jr., commander of the U.S. Pacific Forces, that the situation was critical. He said, quote, I am convinced that U.S. troops with their energy, mobility, and firepower can successfully take the fight to the National Liberation Front. Um, Westmoreland came from the old, an old and wealthy gringo family and had made his way through West Point on that recommendation. He was a stupid man, ignorant of history, and went on to prove it in his politically determined assignment to run the gringo war against Indochina. Another way of putting it would be that he was a gift of heaven sent to the communist side. Westmoreland advocated the sidelining of the puppet Vietnamese and that the U.S. would handle the war all by itself. Westmoreland outlined a three-point plan to win the war. Phase one, 
commitment of U.S. forces necessary to halt losing the war by the end of 1965. Phase two, U.S. forces would mount the ground actions necessary to seize the initiative. This phase would end when the enemy had been worn down, thrown on the defensive, and driven back from populated areas. And phase three, if the enemy persisted in the next 12 to 18 months following phase two, it would be time for their final destruction. By that he meant using weapons of mass destruction, including atomic bombing. As if carpet bombing Vietnam with more tonnage than the U.S. dropped in all of World War II, and massive chemical warfare had not been using such weaponry all along. Johnson approved the plan. Westmoreland predicted victory by the end of 1967. Meanwhile, the one-year tour of duty of American soldiers resulted in shorter basic training. Less well-prepared troops encountered a totally corrupt Vietnam upon arrival. The country had been inundated with manufactured goods from the main PX located in the Saigon suburb of Cholon. It was about the size of New York's Bloomingdale's. The Gringo War had artificially transformed the economy. Universal prostitution and drug use of every kind was something new to the draftees from middle America. Washington encouraged its CETO, C -E -A -T -O, allies to contribute troops. Australia, New Zealand, South Korea, Thailand, and the Philippines all agreed to send them. Major allies, however, including Canada and the UK, declined Washington's troop requests. Nevertheless, the US and allies mounted complex operations they were supposed to be good at, and all of them failed. In July of 1965, Washington's most recent chief puppets were Prime Minister Air Marshal Nguyen Cao Ki and figurehead Chief of State General Nguyen Ban Tu as bosses of the military junta government. In 1967, Tu became president with Ki as his deputy after rigged elections. Although they were nominally a civilian government, the CIA chief and Gringo ambassador expected Key to maintain the real power through the behind-the-scenes military junta. Such well-laid plans worked out on paper, but the always plotting for money and advantage puppet generals, like two, outmaneuvered them. For one thing, the Army faction sidelined Air Force boss Key by filling the ranks with generals from their faction. Two responded by using his own thugs to murder key loyalists through contrived military accidents. Two, mistrustful and indecisive, remained president until 1975, having won a one-candidate election in 1971. The Johnson administration managed media coverage by telling fairy tale stories about progress in the war. Naturally, a credibility gap developed as reality reports came back from first-hand sources. The fairy tale evaporated in the NLF DRV Army Tet Offensive. Now, the Tet Offensive. In late 1967, the Communists lured U.S. Army forces into the hinterlands at Dacto and the U.S. Marines at Quezon bases in Quang Tri Province. There, the Pentagon was more than willing to fight because it could unleash its massive firepower. But what the Gringo generals saw as opportunity was in fact a trap, removing their best units into two locations where the NLF could pound away at them while distracting invader eyes off the Rio Ball. On the 30th of January 1968, the DRV Regular Army and the NLF launched the largest battle of the war. They called it their Tet Offensive. With luck, it would start a war ending national uprising. At the least, it would wake up the gringo population to the fact that they could not win this war and would continue massive losses of men and materiel at a very high financial cost. Over 100 cities were attacked by over 85,000 enemy troops, including assaults on General Westmoreland's headquarters and the U.S. Embassy itself in Saigon. Tet was the final solution to the U.S. assault on Indochina. Its success was a turning point in the worldwide class struggle. Although the scale of the urban offensive initially shocked the U.S. and puppet forces, they responded, damaging some units of the NLF in the former capital city of Wei. The combined DRV regulars and NLF units captured the Imperial Citadel and much of the city 
In the course of their occupation, they were able to execute 3,000 Wei traitor collaborators. In the following Battle of Wei, Gringo forces employed massive firepower and left 80% of the city in ruins. Further north, at Quang Tri City, members of the 1st Cavalry Division and the 1st Puppet Infantry Division killed more than 900 DRV regulars and NLF troops in and around the city. In Saigon, 1,000 NLF fighters fought off 11,000 U.S. and puppet troops for three weeks. The Tet Offensive had another consequence. General Westmoreland lost face. His phony PR statements had been exposed for what they were. He had become the public face of the war. Now Time Magazine's 1965 Man of the Year was on his way out the door, as Tet had ended the career of President Lyndon B. Johnson also. Walter Cronkite said in a broadcast TV editorial, To say that we are closer to victory today is to believe, in the face of the evidence, the optimists who have been wrong in the past. To suggest we are on the edge of defeat is to yield to unreasonable pessimism. To say that we are mired in a stalemate seems the only realistic yet unsatisfactory conclusion." Unquote. LBJ said, If I've lost Cronkite, I've lost Middle America. In March of 1968, Westmoreland was kicked upstairs to a place he could do no more damage, namely as Chief of Staff of the Army. His deputy, Creighton Abrams, succeeded him. On the 10th of May, 68, peace talks began between the USA and the DRV in Paris. Five months later, <clears throat> Johnson gave them halt, the order to halt the bombing of the DRV. Vietnam was a major political issue during the U.S. presidential election in 1968. Republican Party candidate Richard Nixon won the election. Nevertheless, the Gringos were still in Indochina and would take another five years to get them out. Now, we come to the Nixon Doctrine, the Vietnamization 1960, uh, Vietnamization 1969 to 1972. In 1969, Richard Nixon began troop withdrawals. His plan, called the Nixon Doctrine, was to build up the puppet army so it could take over the imperialist war. He called his, his, he called his policy Vietnamization, but it was not working. The anti-war movement was gaining strength in the U.S. Revelation of the My Lai Massacre, in which a Gringo Army platoon raped and killed civilians, added to the 1969 Green Beret Affair, where eight Special Forces soldiers, including the 5th Special Forces Group Commander, were arrested for the murder of a suspected double agent, provoked national and international outrage, and the end, end was at hand. On the 10th of October, 1969, Nixon ordered a squadron of 18 B-52s loaded with nuclear weapons to race to the border of Soviet airspace. His primitive mind thought to convince the Soviet Union that he was a bad man a theory capable of doing anything. Nixon was disappointed that China, the Soviet Union, and now Cuba continued to supply the DRV. In September 1969, Ho Chi Minh died at the age of 79. In 1970, Nixon broadcast that, quote, I am tonight announcing plans for the withdrawal of an additional 150,000 American troops to be completed during the spring of next year. This will bring a total reduction of 265,500 men in our armed forces in Vietnam below the level that existed when we took office 15 months ago." Unquote. U.S. troops were withdrawn from border areas where most of the fighting took place and redeployed along the coast and interior. However, getting rid of them was tougher than getting lice out of an infested flop house. Cambodia, Springtime with Mix Nixon, March and April 1970. Losing the war in Vietnam and Laos, the CIA decided with the Pentagon in tow that the only way to win would be to expand the war into all of Indochina, and they started by invading Cambodia. The Cambodian communists asked the DRV for help. Nixon carpet bombed Cambodia. The local Reds and DRV regulars fought for power against the Gringo imposed puppet Law Noel. From 18 April until 22 July 1970, the imperialists bombed and invaded Cambodia. It was their last hurrah. The invasion, invasion and bombing of Cambodia sparked a nationwide mass movement against the war 
in the U.S., and it took the U.S. anti-war movement to a new level of respectability and strength. National Guard troops fired on student demonstrators at Ohio State University, killing five. And overnight, the U.S. moved into a pre-revolutionary situation as CPSA, PPLP, and SW leaders nationwide prepared for an armed struggle for power. I was in Mexico City for a Society for American Archaeology national meeting at the time, and Rachel and I were staying with the Prieto family, and our two other associates from Calgary were at a hotel near the National Archaeology and Anthropology Museum that had just opened that year. I knew the FBI and CIA would have warrants for me because I had talked to my dad on the telephone and he told me to stay away from the U.S. whatever I did because the FBI was looking for me. But Rachel and I, uh, fortunately, our Canadian Air, uh, Canada Air return flight was nonstop from Mexico City to Calgary and I had the second year of my Ice Mountain Archaeological Expedition to lead as soon as I got back and I would be safely tucked away in the Stikine River Canyon. Anyway, in February 1971, the U.S. sent its puppet army against Laos. The puppet performance was even more pathetic than usual. The Abbott and Costello forces fled along roads littered with their own dead. These soldiers abandoned their vehicles and fought to get onto Gringo helicopters. So much for the Vietnamization. Australia and New Zealand withdrew their soldiers, not wanting to send more to die, in a war that combined the geniuses of the Pentagon and CIA and obviously lost. The anti-war movement spread, spread through every small town in the USA. The U.S. Army collapsed in place as drug-addicted soldiers began to kill their own officers. In Easter 1972, the DRV regulars and NLF volunteer units quickly overran Saigon's northern provinces and from Cambodia threatened to cut the, cut the country in half. Gringo air power halted the offensive, but on April 1, 1972, the last U.S. ground troops were withdrawn. The residual life problem continued as U.S. naval and air forces remained in the Gulf of Tong Tonkin and in Thailand. <coughs> the 1972 election and the Paris Peace Accords. The war was the central issue of the 1972 U.S. presidential election. After Nixon won re-election, his Dr. Strangelove National Security Advisor, Henry Kissinger, continued secret negotiations with North Vietnam's Lee Duc Tho. In October 72, they reached an agreement. Operation Linebacker II, December 1972. After winning the November 72 election, Nixon backed out of the agreement. Then Nixon ordered Operation Linebacker II, a massive bombing of Hanoi and Haiphong, for 10 days from 18 to 29 December 72. On 27 January 73, the officially ended Gringo ground actions in the Vietnam War, but that was all. Nixon stubbornly refused to accept defeat. Nixon would have to be removed by impeachment to get the U.S. out of the war. And the end came when Republican scandals had led to the resignations of Nixon and Agnew. On 9 August 1974, Gerald Ford took over as U.S. President. Congress cut financial aid to the puppet regime, and meanwhile, communist success of their 1973 to 1974 dry season offensive inspired them to keep it up. On December 13th of 1974, DRV regulars attacked Route 14 in Phuc Long Province. Phuc Binh, the provincial capital, fell on 6 January 75. Ford desperately asked Congress for funds to assist and resupply the puppet army before it was overrun, but Congress refused. The fall of Phuc Binh and the lack of an American response were the end of the farce. The speed of DRV success led even the Communist Party Politburo uh, to decide that operations in the Central Highlands would be turned over to General Van Tien Dung, who would seize Pleiku. Le Duan said, Never ha have we had military and political conditions so perfect or a strategic advantage as great as we have now. At the start of 75, the South Vietnamese had three times as much artillery and twice the number of tanks and armored cars as the Communist forces 
They also had 1,400 aircraft and two to one numerical superiority in combat troops over their communist enemies. But nothing could change the fact that the puppet army had never been anything other than a way for common men to get on the gringo tit. It was not, never had been, never could have been a serious military force. On 10th of March 1975, DRV General Dung launched a limited offensive into the Central Highlands, supported by tanks and heavy artillery. The target was Boon Ma Tut in the Dak Lak province. When taking the provincial capital of Pleiku on the road, to the, co the road to the coast would be open for the 76th campaign. But the puppet army was even more pathetic than normal and collapsed in one day. Communist leaders were surprised at the immediacy of their success and decided to go over to a general offensive right now rather than wait until next year. The DRV regulars seized Pleiku. Puppet troops withdrew in what soon turned into another bloody rout. Their retreat degenerated into a desperate scramble for the coast. On the 22nd of March 1975, DRV regulars began another siege of way. Civilians flooded the airport and the docks, while routed puppet soldiers fired on civilians to get what transportation they could steal. On 25 March 1975, way was liberated. Already, DRV rockets rained down on Da Nang and its airport, and by 28 March 1975, 35,000 NLF troops were poised to attack the Saigon suburbs. By the 30th of March of 1975, 100,000 leaderless puppet troops surrendered as the DRV and NLF volunteers marched victoriously through Da Nang. The final liberation offensive began on April 1, 1975, when the Politburo ordered General Dong to launch that final offensive to liberate Saigon in the Ho Chi Minh campaign and to have it completed by May 1st to mark the victory of communism on International Workers' Day. On April 7, 75, three DRV divisions attacked Sean Lok, 40 miles east of Saigon. On 21 April 75, Puppet troops had abandoned Sean Luck, running towards Saigon. On 25 April 75, DRV tanks reached Bien Hoa and turned towards Saigon, brushing aside isolated puppet units along the way. And by 26 April 75, puppet troops had collapsed on all fronts. On 27 April 75, 100,000 DRV and NLF troops encircled Saigon. And on May Day 1975, Thirty years after the red flag flew over the bobbed out Reichstag building in Berlin, it flew over the abandoned gringo colonial embassy and all of Saigon was now renamed Ho Chi Minh City. And that concludes our discussion of the U.S. war against Vietnam. And in the next, we will take up the establishment of the Socialist Republic of Vietnam and bring it up to its contemporary situation.